Uh, let's uh, get underway. Uh, so there, there are two, actually two handouts. Uh, last week I was so screwed up uh, doing the, the fact that my computer uh, had, had crashed and uh, recovering it uh, uh, meant that I didn't get a very good set of notes together. So uh, there is a better set of notes covering uh, what I talked about last week, uh, as well as the material uh, to be uh, dealt with uh, in this week. Uh, it, it would be totally remiss uh, at this point if uh, I, I didn't point out that uh, in this past week, it was the 100th birthday of uh, Stan Gertner, uh, a person who made enormous contributions to this field. Uh, and uh, uh, we're so fortunate that he uh, is, is here living amongst us. So, uh, here, 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 here comes some more. <laughs> okay. So, uh, today uh, we're going to deal with uh, cells and genome expression. For the most part, it will be dealing with humans. Uh, and uh, next Sunday is going to be uh, the final lecture, or not lecture, I should say, the final seminar in, in this series. And, and we'll present uh, uh, sort of the fruits of all this understanding. Uh, that's come about. I'm going to uh, not uh, do any speculation, but uh, present to you results, uh, research results that have all occurred within this calendar year that are both surprising and, uh, uh, and extremely interesting. So, Multicellular creatures, eukaryotes ir like ourselves, are all created, we start out, as single cells. In the case of humans, that beginning is an egg, an egg cell fertilized by a sperm cell uh, into a diploid cell called a zygote. The zygote contains the complete genome of the creature uh, as inherited from its two parents. That cell will initially just numerically multiply before beginning to diversify into many different cell types that will characterize the creature throughout its life cycle. Every cell in the creature's body will have the same genome. Clearly, the creature's many different cell types must access different part genes in, that, in the genome to produce the different proteins uh, and mac macromolecules that that particular cell type requires to execute its particular function. How this process proceeds is to term genome expression, and it remains very much uh, an area of active research. And while we'll be giving an awful lot of attention to the genome in this process, you of course realize that the genome of itself could do nothing without the capabilities of uh, the access uh, of the capabilities of the cell uh, uh, to which uh, it, it finds itself. So molecular creatures like our cells are conceived, born, grow into adulthood, and eventually die. Compared to single cell prokaryotes, an immediate problem presents itself as to how eukaryotes uh, grow, reproduce, and age. Eukaryotes uh, end up as a cooperative collection of many different kinds uh, of cells. How does this diversity come about, and, and what controls it? Fortunately, I don't have to come up with how the uh, evolutionary solution to this came about, uh, as I will just assume that every living creature has come from a parent much like itself. From parents, I should say. Animals and plants start their lives as a single cell, typically some sort of fertilized egg turned to zygote. 
During the development, this cell repeatedly divides to produce many different cells <laughs> in a final pattern of spectacular complexity and precision. Ultimately, the organism's genome, working in the creature cells, will determine that pattern. The organism's entire genome is present in every cell. The cells differ, not because they contain different genetic information, but because they express different pieces, uh, that is, genes uh, of the creature's genome. This selective gene expression controls four essential processes by which an embryo is constructed from the initial zygote. That's cell proliferation, producing many cells from the one, cell spe specialization, creating cells with the different characteristics uh, at different positions, cell interactions, coordinating the behavior of one cell with that of its neighbors, and for cell movement, uh, rearranging the cells to form the structured tissues uh, and, 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 organs, and organs that make up the organ, the, the creature. Uh, in a developing embryo, these processes are all going on at once. There's no command center. Each cell acts pretty much on its own, based on its own copy of the genetic instructions and its particular circumstances. The way a cell behaves depends on its past as well as its present environment. Each cell executes its special behavior not because it is continually updated on its task, but because it has a record of the instructions its parent cell received uh, during uh, early embryonic development. So here's the fertilized egg leading to uh, what we could call a zygote, uh, and uh, then embryonic stealth cells, which are claimed to be puri, pluripotent, that is, they can become anything, uh, become multipotent stem cells, uh, leading to uh, mesoderm, which generates bone, muscle, and blood, and, and endoderm, uh, sort of your gut, lungs, and liver, and, and the ectoderm uh, giving you things like brain, skin, and so forth. And a gastrula is formed along the way in this process. Down at the bottom, I show the zygote as the uh, fertilized egg leading to a bast the blastrula, which takes on this particular shape, and then finally uh, into this gastrula shape here, which is starting now to take on some of the appearance of what will become a fetus. For the first 12 hours after conception, the fertilized egg remains just a single cell. After about 30 hours or so, it divides from one cell into two, and some 15 to 20 hours later, the two cells divide to become four, and so at the end of three days, the fertilized egg has become a berry-like structure made up of 16 cells. This structure is uh, uh, amusingly called a morilla, uh, which is Latin for mulberry. Mm -hmm. During the first uh, eight or nine days after conception, the cells that will eventually form the embryo continue to vibe. At the same time, the hollow structure in which they have arranged themselves, uh, called the, the blastocyte, is slowly carried towards the uterus by tiny hair-like follicle, follicles uh, called cilla. The cytoblast, though only the size of a pinhead, is actually composed of hundreds of cells. During this critically important process of implantation, the blastocytes must attach itself to the lining of the uterus or the pregnancy will not survive. Taking a closer look at the uterus, you would see that the blastocyst actually buries itself in the lining of the uterus where it will be able to get nourishment from the mother's blood. Now, this is just a, a note I've thrown aside because of what I'll be talking about next next week, 
The prevalent view during the 20th century was that mature cells were permanently locked into their differentiated state and could not return to a fully immature pluripotent, pluripotent stem cell. Uh, say, the, a cell when differentiated would no, be no longer able to go back to that status. And that was all changed uh, er, er, early in this century uh, by the work of Shinya Yamanaka uh, in 2006, where he and his team generated pluripotent stem cells from adult mouse cell fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are a kind of cell that are often used to uh, repair a wound. Later, he and his team also did it, the, the task uh, generating human uh, pluripotent shells. We'll have much more to talk about that next week. So this cascade, which you cannot possibly see, uh, I can't see it uh, myself, but it simply shows the cascading of how you come out of the uh, fertilized egg into uh, pluripotent cells, which then go into those three different kinds uh, of cells that further break down and there's a continual cascade of further and further differentiation uh, uh, that, it, that occurs all the way down to finally in the end and there's about 200 uh, different kinds of cell uh, present in an adult human. This issue of replication time uh, is uh, sort of important in, 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 in a cell. Uh, in, in this time, uh, G1 is just basically the time required for the cell to take on the nourishment that it mean, needs to uh, 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 go on to further stages of being able to uh, reproduce itself. Uh, then it needs to duplicate its own g the genome to pass on to the next generation of cells. Uh, G2 is then getting itself ready for the final mitosis in which the cell ends up splitting in, in, into two pieces. So for a human cell, uh, that time timeline is about uh, 20 hours. Uh, in, in yeast, uh, it's like two hours. Uh, in another kind of yeast, it's an hour and a half. They're both single-celled creatures. So, uh, uh, and interesting, you might wonder why do fruit why are fruit flies so often used uh, in research? It's that they go through their uh, generation uh, in a pretty fast way. They're able to reproduce their cell types in something just like uh, about eight minutes. So. Here's how that cell doubling would go. Uh, it's just simple arithmetic, where uh, here are the number of cells, these are the number of hours after the uh, fertilization of the egg has taken place, and here I've listed days and weeks. So uh, at the end of a week, you still have only something like 256 cells uh, that have been uh, that have been formed and they are not ready yet to start differentiating and so on uh, that multiplication goes uh, at, at the end of uh, something like uh, nearly three weeks that number has gone up to 16 million and you can see as I've shown here uh, at, at something uh, uh, approaching six weeks uh, you have, uh, if you follow this succession, more cells than you actually need uh, to make a, uh, a human. So that uh, cell development, because of the way it goes, just doubling uh, every, 20, uh, every 20 hours, starts out very slowly, but uh, as it, that you accumulate further and further uh, numbers of cells, they're greater doubling. Uh, causes them to grow uh, uh, very rapidly. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, on your genome, on your genome expression, 
I'll pick this is on. <laughs> Talk loud, we'll pick it up. Yeah. So, on your uh, genome expression of eukaryotes, I think there's a fourth uh, function or process that maybe some of the biologists in the audience might know better than that, but what's called program cell program cell death. And that is going to explain partially why you don't end up with as many cells here. Oh, you bet. Cell, cells don't just die randomly. Oh, you, you bet. So there, you, you need a really strict control on the number of cells uh, that are being formed. I just, this was just uh, uh, an example of what happened if just simple doubling took place. No, but I'm going back to the okay. earlier slide. Uh -huh. You identify four processes. Cell uh -huh. proliferation, cell specialization, cell interaction, cell movement. Yeah. And I think there's a fifth, which is called <laughs> programmed cell death, uh -huh. which is how some structures develop. That some, some cells die uh, because the genome tells them to die. It's a separate step. Okay. There may, that... be a better, there may be a better biologist in the group, but, but, but I think that relates both to that slide uh, and to this one. Is that happening during the embryonic stage, yes. you know? It is. Yeah, that's okay. how you get how you get fingers out of a out of a finger plate, for example. Thank you. So now let's go to a sort of an overview of cells in humans. This is again probably pretty hard to see, but uh, the uh, cell number, uh, so uh, a, a, a 70 kilogram male has roughly 30 trillion human cells. Fat and muscle cells uh, are large, 72% uh, of the cellular mass, uh, but are only uh, a tenth of a percent of the total number. So you can see some cells are a heck of a lot bigger uh, uh, than, than, uh, than others. About 87% of, of the number, uh, uh, are, are by number now, are blood cells, uh, which are extremely small. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm even having trouble seeing this myself. Uh, uh, here, here are uh, 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 blood cells. Uh, this is a lipid that uh, is uh, not in cell form. Uh, it's about 25% of the mass uh, of your body. It's not cell, it's just simply a fluid. Uh, and it's interestingly a, a fluid that has more sodium uh, in, in solution than potassium, which is different from what's on the interior of cells. In the interior of cells, there's a surplus of potassium over sodium. And that's because that potassium, as you recall, is widely used in providing the energy cycle in the cell through ATP and ADP. This is kind of a nice way of, of drawing uh, what's uh, present in, in, in your body. Here's the number of uh, uh, cells uh, <coughs> that are, that are uh, red blood cells. These are white blood cells. And so you can see that blood makes up by number a very large fraction uh, of the total number of cells in your body. I believe these are gut cells and then this remaining 5% over here is just uh, uh, other cell types uh, that are present uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the body. So what the average lifetime of your cells, uh, so let's see, there was a turnover every day uh, of about 20, uh, 300 and 
30 billion cells turn over every day in, 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 in your body. Uh, most of those are, are red blood cells. Uh, so here's an average life of some of the cells in your body. <coughs> Here is a, a hair cell. Uh, you don't kill it, but it does grow. And when you've had enough of its growth, you cut it off. Uh, uh, and that's about three, just three, three tenths uh, uh, of a millimeter per day. Very slow. Uh, wisdom teeth enamel stops growing when you're about 12 years old. The visual cortex, your eye, stops growing uh, uh, just as soon as you're born. So that you get that one shot uh, at, at, at that. And your, the amount of gray matter, uh, apparently, in your mind stops growing when you're between uh, two and a half and three years old. Skin cells uh, are replaced uh, every 30 days, uh, and the, your skeleton, uh, that is the cells, it isn't that your skeleton disappears <laughs> and you get a new one, uh, it's that the cells are replaced over a period uh, that extends to, uh, to just about 10 years. Uh, and your Achilles tendon, uh, I don't know whether it's of any consequence, stops growing uh, when you're 11 years old. So stem cells are really key in this uh, whole business. Uh, they have three properties that set them apart from other cells. They're self-replicating. Uh, most body cells can go through a limited number of divisions and then die. Stem cells can continue to divide indefinitely. So a stem cell will often split up into a differentiated cell and a stem cell so that it's, you still have a stem cell available uh, to continue uh, reproducing whatever kind of cell it, it was assigned uh, to uh, reproduce. The cell cells are undifferentiated. They don't have a specialized features associated with most of the cells of the body, such as muscles, nerves, fat. They can divide and develop into cells of other type to a greater or lesser degree, and I'll show you what that is. Embryonic cell, stem cells, which are the most basic kind of stem cell, uh, is uh, uh, capable for, oh, for a short time uh, to uh, be able to go ahead and form uh, uh, germ cells, which are, are capable uh, of becoming eggs or, uh, or sperm. Uh, after about five or six days after fertilization, the embryo, called a, bly a bliocast, uh, a ball of cells, uh, it's a ball of cells with a clump of stem cells inside, and the embryonic stem cells uh, can be extracted from the bliocast and grown in a laboratory culture. And if you remember, that was a thing that was causing so much havoc in biological research. Uh, this search for embryonic stem cells and uh, uh, people, uh, uh, especially right to lifers, uh, used it in the strongest way they could to uh, uh, go after uh, people involved in that kind of uh, uh, research. The first uh, embryonic cells to form are, they're totally, po totally, po totally potent. They can turn into anything uh, needed uh, to produce viable offspring. A few days later, as the embryo uh, develops, the stem cells are only then pluripotent. They can turn into any form of cells found in an adult, but not additional tissues such as you have in the placenta. After seven to eight weeks of, of development, when the major organs have developed, the embryo becomes a fetus. And pluripotent stem cells are found in the developing fetus. Adult cells, uh, stem cells, 
Uh, there are obviously stem cells uh, in our body. Uh, we have to keep growing uh, pieces of our liver, pieces of our skin, and, and, and so on. And these adult some cells are termed multipotent. They can only develop into a limited range of differentiated cell types, usually a particular kind of tissue or organ. And here is that list uh, of uh, ever decreasing potency from totipotent uh, down to unipotent, where you can only make uh, one kind uh, of uh, a, uh, a, a, a cell. Now, as I said, each and every cell contains a copy of the organism's entire genome. The organism is made up of various kinds of, uh, of, of cells, so there must be some, something uh, called an epigenomic that is beyond, outside the gene factor, must come into play to specify what part of the genome is expressed in, say, a muscle cell as compared to uh, uh, the piece of the genome expressed in a liver cell. So while the, the genome remains the same in every cell, the expression has to be controlled by factors external to the genome. Now, the enormous size of mammalian genomes, remember our genome has 3.6 3 billion base pairs in, in it. And it, it, it's so big that it requires a, uh, a particular piece of apparatus called a histone. I shouldn't call it a piece of apparatus, it's just a piece of stuff made up of eight, eight, eight pieces of protein that form in a way that allow the DNA to wrap itself around it uh, and allows that uh, thing, our genome, if it were stretched out in a straight line, would end up being something like six and a half feet long. Uh, you have to be able to wrap that up and place it in every cell in your body. So uh, the uh, uh, process by which that goes on is the wrapping up of the genome uh, uh, around these things termed histones. Uh, histones uh, are kind of interesting. They have a, a kind of a positive charge uh, associated with them and the DNA on the surface carries a negative charge, so there's an electrostatic attraction uh, for these things uh, to be held together. The DNA wraps itself uh, around there. I think uh, in that double wrapping, uh, it takes up something like about 147 base pairs. Uh, and uh, then uh, these things uh, further can uh, 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 get wrapped up I into even tighter uh, uh, packaging uh, and uh, that packaging uh, will have a, uh, a, a real uh, impact on, on what DNA is actually accessible to you. Uh, it, it's pretty clear that a cell would have very good uh, access to the uh, uh, part of the cell that is here between the histones, histones, uh, and uh, a much harder time getting at uh, uh, stuff that's wrapped up uh, somewhere tightly uh, in this bundle. So the bundling of, of the DNA is one way that control is uh, exhibited or, uh, to uh, allowing you to have access to a particular genome uh, that would be uh, somewhere in that uh, 3.6 billion uh, base pair uh, piece of DNA. The other thing that uh, goes on is the methylization of nucleotides, particularly the, met the, the nucleotide cytosine. Uh, in the cell's DNA. Uh, it represents the expression of a gene when it occurs in the gene promoter, it represses the expression 
of the gene. Uh, when it occurs in the scenes, genes promoter or enhancer. Uh, and during uh, developmental pro phases, the DNA methylization process in new uh, uh, in the genome undergoes alterations uh, of, of a result of regulated balance between uh, the unique DNA methylization uh, that fine tunes uh, tissue specific gene expression. So you see these little pieces uh, out here of methylization of particular uh, pieces of, of particular nucleotides and in particular cytosine seems to be one that is a real target uh, as an inhibitor. And here's what methylization uh, uh, occurs. Here's the cytosine nucleotide and rather than uh, having just a simple uh, hydrogen atom uh, on that uh, uh, particular uh, cell uh, uh, molecules location, uh, there is three hydrogens and a carbon uh, uh, attached. Uh, notice the bonding uh, would be the same. Uh, one here and here there are three to the carbons and there's the fourth bond for, uh, for the carbon. But that methylization plays a big role in determining whether uh, the gene in which that nucleotide is occurring is actually going to be expressed in that particular, uh, in that particular cell. Any questions at that point? Yeah, yeah. I'm confused, uh, I'm confused about the difference between DNA as this enormously long structure and chromosomes, which we learned were sort of independent. Can you clarify they're that? The, they're the same thing. Uh, the, the genome uh, is a big molecule uh, of DNA. Except it, it, it's, of course, broken up uh, into specific sectors that uh, allow you to express particular proteins uh, or some other complex macromolecule. But uh, the DNA and the genome are the same thing. Well, are the chromosomes these chunks you talk about because they say, well, well, Humans have X number of chromosomes, something else has 22, and so on. Yes. Well, it turns out that differently uh, from uh, a single cell creature, where its DNA was just one circular piece, uh, in, in a uh, uh, multi-cell creature uh, like, like a human, the genome is broken up into a whole series of linear pieces that uh, often, uh, are, uh, when you can, are able to see them, end up looking like this. So they're lin linear bundles uh, uh, of DNA with, with pieces uh, that define uh, the beginning and the end of that strand. And uh, so there are like 43 of, uh, of, of these things, 46 altogether, uh, of these things uh, that you would see uh, when a, a cell uh, was, uh, was ripe for div division. So in eukaryotes, it's not just a single piece, it's bundles of single fibers. And, and in a sense, uh, you can see that's absolutely essential. Uh, because when you were reading the DNA of a single cell creature, there was one entry point and you read it all the way around. If you had to do that for something that was a thousand times uh, longer, uh, longer than that, you, 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 would, you just couldn't do it. So there are multiple entry points into reading that, uh, the DNA uh, of a, a eukaryote in a human being. Uh, I don't know what that number is. It must be several hundred because it breaks the time down to reading that, that num number to just something like 20 hours. Could you say something about 
methylation, <clears throat> uh, methylation, methylization. Uh, well, I, I have no idea uh, of what the origin of the word is, uh, but chemically it, it's the replacement uh, on this nucleotide cytosine, uh, uh, which would have a hydrogen bond here uh, off, this, off this carbon uh, vertex. Uh, it, it now has a uh, CH3 uh, bond. You can call it what you want, uh, but uh, they call it methylization. Somebody who knows some chemistry here maybe could tell me what it means. Ah, Lowell. <laughs> I don't know what the origin of the word is, but a methyl group is CH3, ethyl is C2H5, and so forth. Propyl is C3H7. Okay. Yeah. Methylization is the addition of a methyl group. Uh, and, so and, and, and that's what the CH3 is yes. that, that yeah, Henry said, so okay. So I didn't know that was the name of that stuff. Uh, I would have gone crazy if I tried to learn the name of everything that I've encountered here. There were just thousands of things uh, that uh, uh, I had to leave unnamed. Okay, so types of cell in, 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 in the body. Uh, here's just some depiction. Uh, I think this is probably somewhat like what they uh, look like. Uh, uh, stem cells, bone cells. These little platelets here are, are blood cells and I'll come back to those uh, later on. Fat, uh, fat cells, endothiles, endothial cells sex cells, that's uh, egg, and these little guys out here are the sperm, uh, and uh, uh, cancer cell. So these are just simply descriptions uh, that you might as well read for yourself uh, about uh, these particular kinds of cells. Uh, So, uh, when, in your leisure, give it a, 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 a read. And, and along the way, a couple of cells struck me as unusual, as, as cells go. And, and the first one, to me, uh, that I think of as unusual was a red blood cell. Uh, now, two gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, are absolutely critical to animal life on Earth. The energy in all our cells comes from the oxidation of glucose, uh, uh, which ends up producing CO2 as, the waste pro as a waste product. Thus, uh, our, uh, we would need a system that can deliver CO, uh, that can deliver oxygen to every cell in our body and remove CO2 from those cells. The Earth's atmosphere contains 20% uh, oxygen and only four hundredths of a percent of CO2. By the way, the, the rest of the uh, stuff is mostly nitrogen. They, so uh, it, it would seem that breathing uh, is a great way to start out uh, dealing with the problem. Uh, and, and, and then you would have uh, a need for a cell that would be able to properly execute the exchange uh, of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the cellular level. Evolution solved the problem. So here's the here's your lung and uh, the things where the air uh, finally ends up uh, being uh, positioned in your leg. And in that uh, in, in that place, uh, a, this red blood cell is going to pick up oxygen and leave off carbon dioxide. So let's start actually from the other end. Your blood flows through the cells and in those cells now because uh, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, are, are being depleted in oxygen you have to take out the carbon dioxide waste product and 
what came in as 20% oxygen and four tenths of a percent carbon dioxide, you're bringing back to expel uh, into the atmosphere stuff that now uh, has depleted oxygen, but a great increase in carbon dioxide. So uh, the cell comes back up into your lung and expels CO2 uh, into the atmosphere. In the meantime, it picks up oxygen that it carries down uh, into your cells and because your cells now have less, relatively less oxygen in it, uh, just the law of partial pressures ends up, uh, you're being able to transfer uh, oxygen into those cells and remove uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, uh, the actual process by which this takes place is, uh, uh, is rather complex, uh, but nevertheless uh, it, 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 it works uh, simply and beautifully for the, for the most part. The red blood cell is, is then a wondrous cell, but it's very, it, it's very different. It doesn't come from another red blood cell. It actually, uh, and at the end of in its life, it enters up surrendering its nucleus uh, in order to make more room for hemoglobin. Uh, that's the stuff that allows it to uh, attach oxygen. Hemoglobin uh, is a molecule built around iron that's really good at, at attaching oxygen. Uh, and, uh, and so by giving up the nucleus, it's able to get more hemoglobin in, uh, in, in, into the cell uh, and uh, also allows it to be more deformable so it can end up moving through your body uh, e even better than it uh, could if it hadn't given up its nucleus. So the uh, blood cell actually is produced uh, in the marrow of, of, of certain bones. Uh, the uh, major type of, of cell, the one we're really focusing on here, is, is uh, red blood cells, but there are uh, other cells, white blood cells, which have the job of fighting infection uh, in your body, and platelets, uh, which are a great help in helping your blood coagulate, so that should you sustain a cut, uh, it, it tends to, uh, to uh, close up. Uh, and uh, the rest of the, your, your blood is, uh, is a thing called plasma, which is simply uh, the liquid component of blood. Uh, so uh, this just tells you where those uh, bones are that produce it. Uh, uh, there is a, an endrioplast. Uh, Erythroblast. Oh dear. Whoop. Whoop. Now, what was that all about? No idea. So, where was that? Get in there. So, so uh, what, what happens as uh, the cell uh, develops, uh, it, it, as it matures in the bone, hemoglobin appears in the cell, and, and, and as that happens, the nucleus of the cell is becoming progressively smaller. After a few days, the cell loses its nucleus and is then introduced into the bloodstream in the vascular channels uh, of the marrow, and it's loaded with hemoglobin. So it loses its nucleus, cannot reproduce itself, stokes up on hemoglobin, and after about 120 days, it's removed uh, because uh, it, it's just wearing down. Uh, and, but it has done a great job in serving it, the organism's needs. The next cell that's really kind of uh, uh, strange uh, uh, are, are the cells in the nervous system. So uh, 
here, as uh, you, you might imagine, uh, are, are the nerves as distributed throughout your body. The central nervous system uh, involves the brain and, and the uh, and your spinal column. Uh, here are sort of the appearance of uh, the cells that that that, that occur, uh, uh, and the thing that's uh, unusual about nerve cells uh, is uh, that uh, they do not naturally go through mit mitosis. That is, they don't reprodu reproduce themselves, uh, and some reason why they might not do that is some of them uh, reach the order of a meter in length. Uh, those are the long nerve cells that come out of the base of your spine and go all the way down to your feet. Uh, and, and so uh, they are long cells and you could imagine what kind of a time they might have <laughs> in trying to reproduce themselves. Uh, uh, I, I, I couldn't uh, uh, make out too much, uh, too much uh, of a model as to how that could happen. Uh, the maximum velocity uh, of a signal through, uh, through, uh, through, uh, a, uh, through a nerve cell is only 120 meters per second. So uh, in, in a six foot tall person transmission from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head uh, uh, would take the order of a hundredth of a second. And uh, the minimum time uh, for the exchange of information between cells uh, is 10 to the minus 3 uh, seconds. One of the things that uh, I, I noticed was reading was cells that have myelin wrapped around them are the ones that have the, the very fastest velocity uh, 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 of signal transmission. And this is a, a, an electron microscope picture uh, of the myelin wrapping itself uh, around uh, the uh, extended part of, of, of a nerve cell. And this would then be an example of how the nerve cell down at the other end. So there's kind of three functions, a sensory, a sensory uh, neuron, um, interneurons that carry the message, and motor neurons that when the message is sent back, you get a reaction uh, in a muscle cell. And this is a picture uh, of a nerve cell with part of, its, uh, with part of itself uh, planted in a muscle cell uh, to get uh, the reaction that's required. Okay, I'm going to switch now uh, to uh, a, a couple of serious uh, topics uh, before I finish. First of all is the issue uh, of the cost of se sequencing the human genome. I call it the second revolution uh, you'll see, I think there are three revolutions that have taken place uh, in, in this business uh, of molecular biology. The first, obviously, was the discovery of the structure of DNA. The second was the uh, ability to sequence and read the entire human genome. And this it shows you the cost. Uh, of uh, accessing the human genome. Right now, uh, it, it's down to, uh, oh, I, I would say, six or seven hundred dollars to uh, do a complete sequence on the human genome. Though I, there was an announcement that uh, they, uh, this particular uh, group here uh, feels they can uh, sequence the whole genome for less than a hundred dollars. <laughs> so uh, it could become uh, possible, I don't know if it's desirable, to have a copy of the human genome of every person uh, 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 alive. The third revolution, and this is the one that is more, uh, more in a sense, perplexing. Uh, 
Well, it, it, there was a very rapid development of technologies to read DNA. Uh, the ability to write it has lagged behind. Uh, DNA synthesis technologies developed to date uh, may differ in their ability to bridge the D DNA uh, gap, and their continuous development is driven by two main factors. First of all, the lack of methods to routinely make DNA of unlimited lengths and scale and cost, and yet there is an ever-increasing demand for it from a variety of places. It at the present time, it costs about 10 cents per base pair to make a DNA molecule, uh, which means uh, that the human genome, if you wanted to put it together, would cost on that basis $360 million. There's a technology out there uh, that uh, believes it could bring that cost down uh, to something uh, like 10, uh, uh, $36,000. So they're th thinking of being able to bring the cost uh, of writing a, a genome down by a factor of a thousand. So the largest synthetic genome to be supplanted in a living cell is, was done in an E. coli uh, in 2019. Uh, that E. coli is referred to as syn, I take it for synthetic, 61. Uh, it has turned out to be not quite as vigorous as natural E. coli. It grows about 60% slower, and it may be suggesting that there's something fundamentally important being missed in the alternative coding uh, of that synthetic gene. Uh, genome, rather, I should say, the synthetic genome. So, the ethical implications, particularly of being able to write uh, the gene, uh, a, a genome, uh, I, I, I think are uh, I, I, extraordinary. There's just a whole host of ethical concerns that you uh, might have. And, and I really suggest that you uh, go to take a, a look on the web to learn more about the thinking on that subject. Uh, little seems to be happening uh, with regard to oversight. Uh, there is an article which I referred to at the bottom called Synthetic Biology and the Ethics of Knowledge uh, by Tom Douglas and Julian uh, Shibulu, Shibulu, uh, uh, uh by that gentleman. So, uh, it, it, and the literature that will show up uh, on the web is, is, is really pretty vast. Uh, Many are concerned simply uh, about the weaponization of being able to create synthetic creatures that you have no defense against that uh, would end up uh, being able to be extraordinarily useful uh, in, in, war in, in, in warfare. Uh, I, I uh, hesitate to go into the subject myself uh, but it is certainly something uh, to think about. Uh, and uh, I was following uh, very actively uh, work by uh, George Church at Harvard. Uh, and, and in around 2000, 20, 20, 2018, 2019, uh, he, 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 he was getting together a group of people that were actively uh, in, in going after trying to write the human genome. Uh, a, certainly a difficult and enormous uh, undertaking. Somehow I, all the wind has gone out of the sails of that operation because I haven't heard another thing about it. Uh, uh, but it does indicate that they probably, uh, somewhere along the way, got the word to, uh, to uh, certainly tone it down. And uh, while uh, Church uh, has, re has rewritten the genome of an E. coli, uh, 
I, I don't hear any uh, uh, word from uh, that laboratory uh, about uh, trying to do the same thing uh, with the human genome. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll, we should have a great time. Uh, we'll be able to just reap the benefits of everything that we've learned and see how the stuff that has been learned is now being used to fight disease, reduce aging, and, and uh, believe it or not, create an egg from a male. <laughs> so, uh, please, uh, any no, discussion? I don't even ask questions. Lowell. Are you going to talk about gene editing next week? I'm, I'm gene editing. editing. Gene editing? CRISPR? Oh, CRISPR. Okay. No, I'm not. Uh, because those are technologies that are here now. Oh, you bet. So I, I'm certainly just going to talk about stuff that is uh, present now. And, and, uh, uh, and, and CRISPR certainly is used. Uh, uh, that's the way synthetic DNA is actually put into, a, uh, uh, into an E. coli. You, you snip out pieces and substitute in synthetic pieces uh, in, in, in the place uh, of, of the uh, uh, gene, uh, real, what should I say, the true genome that was there before. So CRISPR is used, though I won't say much about it. I, what would you like me to say? <laughs> <laughs> The point is that those, I don't know that that's all, I don't know that CRISPR is all synthetic DNA. In fact, I didn't think it was, but there may be a geneticist here that knows better than I. But the, the question of, of a, a third revolution, I think rather than making it synthetic DNA, is modifying human DNA with gene editing programs in CRISPR, uh, which is, a, is, is things that are happening now. Uh, uh -huh. There was a, a case in China several years sure. ago now uh, where a physician uh, inserted genes into an embryo and changed the genetic makeup uh, from the point of view not only of function but of reproduction. Uh, and that was a, a, a Rubicon uh, that people were very hesitant to cross. Uh, and the, there has been a lot of discussion about that. And that's, that's, it was kind of a question about is that something you're going to do next week? If not, that's fine. But you bet. it seems to me to be more of a, a pressing ethical problem yeah. than, than synthetic DNA. Yeah, so I, I, I think what probably happened, Lowell, is I just found synthetic DNA more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Could I? Uh, Hi, Charles. Yes, Could I just comment in, in defense of George Church? Uh -huh. Not so much in defense of writing the human genome, I think the point that was just made is, is correct, that we can modify it in lots of clinically useful ways. But George's view is to provide the technology for de-extinction. Did I miss your, any comments that you made about um, writing the, the genomes of animals that became extinct? No, I did not. Okay, so I'll just mention that his, his big view is that sometimes that one can imagine would be useful. Sure. And his current uh, paradigm is the woolly mammoth. Now, at first glance, that seems kind of crazy. Where would we find the habitat that, that humans would be willing to cede to the woolly mammoth? But his thinking on it is, is very interesting. He said, well, they, they need to be at the, at the poles. They need to, to be browsing the vegetation on the poles so that the snow will be revealed. The ice and the snow will be revealed, thereby reflecting solar radiation. Mm -hmm. And the goal then is to, is to use these animals, which would be kind of nice in a, a broad sense to have our extinct animals available, but that it could be useful in, in, in the reducing the risk of, of global climate change. Uh -huh. Well, I, I mean, there are just so many uh, good uses to synthetic DNA, if you were able to do it, or uh, just retrieve uh, 
and, and, and make active the DNA of extinct creatures. Uh, that uh, uh, you can't argue with that, but I think attention really has to be paid to what are the potential downsides. Yes. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. And, and, I think a good way to look at what Church tries to do, he is in many ways an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he really is trying to do things on a very large scale mm -hmm. and is always interested in cost. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to drive uh, the cost of uh, doing it, uh, doing the job down. And, yeah. oh, he's certainly been successful. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> A couple of comments, much more mundane. Uh, you showed uh, where the burrow is, ribs, and vertebrae, and so on. Uh, I, at dinner, I've often seen marrow in round bones, the legs and arms of creatures. So I think there may be something missing there. Well, I, I think I'm just having amazing difficulty hearing. <clears throat> well, there seems to be marrow in the round, ah, round bones. Yes. It's just Oh, yeah, and that marrow everywhere, in, in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, apparently, uh, they feel that the, uh, uh, that there were particular locales. I have no, uh, no real knowledge one way or the other uh, to whether what they're saying is right or not. Well, the other comment, uh, pretty superficial, but apparently the birds have a much more efficient respiratory system than the mammals, uh -huh. having evolved during a period of rather low oxygen. Uh -huh. Sort of fascinating. Uh -huh. hmm. Hmm. Any other remarks, questions? Uh, Henry, you uh, just, just a comment, many of you probably were here when uh, Lester Goldstein gave a big, long talk a uh, very detailed talk about the human genome and about the quote CRISPR process and so forth yes. some years ago. Yes. Maybe five years ago. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm, maybe I'll give him a <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I don't see Lester. I was looking for him, but I don't see him. Saw <laughs> Lester, did I don't know. Okie doke. Thank you. So uh, ne next week, fun. <laughs>